What's up, everybody? I'm Dave Miranda, and this is episode 96 of Just Give Me Five. I hope you guys are doing great. Continue to be amazing. We got an incredible show lined up for you today. But first, here's a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Victory Legal Solutions. Victory Legal Solutions is a company created and owned by Vanessa Ramirez. Their goal is to help navigate your legal situation and get you connected with the legal team that treats you like a client, not a number. They provide solutions for your car accident problems, including towing, rental, repairs, medical, and legal. So regardless of fault, give your Victory team a call and let them give you the options to make the claims process less stressful. That's Victory Legal Solutions, taking your legal matters under their wings. If you guys caught episode 95, you saw we had none other than the one and only Karina. And let me tell you, boy, does that woman have some stories. You know, so much history from her musical background to her radio career, her son Heavenson, and his journey. Um, you know, Friday Night Flavors was a big deal for a lot of local artists. And so for her to be a part of that, playing artist records, you know, helping them get notoriety in the scene, it's a big deal. You know, it meant a lot. So, you know, shout out to you, Karina, and thank you so much for being a part of the show. We had a really, really great time, and uh, just thank you for being a part of our platform. All right. But today's guest is not only a legend in the Arizona scene, but in the music industry, period. We're going to talk about his early days as a musician and how he got inspired to make music. We're also going to talk about how his band, The Jim Blossoms, were formed and the success of New Miserable Experience. We're going to talk about some memorable performances of theirs, including Saturday Night Live, the city of Tempe honoring them with Allison Road Avenue, and so much more. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I present to you Robin Wilson. Hello, I'm Robin Wilson, lead singer of Jim Blossoms and part-time singer for the Smithereens. And all I'm saying is just give me five. Well, as a child, my dad's record collection was the first stuff I ever heard. So it was things like Buddy Holly, the Beach Boys, Dion and the Belmonts, right. uh, oldies like that, Sam Cooke. There you go. That kind of thing. But it was when I was in the third grade, I was eight years old, and we would stay up late on Friday nights to see the midnight special. Okay. And uh, one night at a uh, sleepover at a friend's house, we stayed up to see the midnight special, and they debuted the video for Bohemian Rhapsody by yeah. Queen. And every neuron in my brain fired up, and my uh, my little eight-year-old head just about exploded. And I decided right then that I, I really wanted to be a rock singer. Nice. So I've been on this path ever since, and so I have the opening line of Bohemian Rhapsody tattooed go. here, and that's where all my tattoos started with that one. And then um, now I got now I'm covered in lyrics. Yeah. But, you know, then once you get a little older, I, you know, I was working at uh, Tower Records in the, in the 1980s. And I, when, I, when I started there, I was heavily into the sort of techno stuff uh, that was popular at the time. Things like Depeche Mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alphaville. Like those Celtic bands, like Simple Minds and U2. Yeah. Right. Big Country. Uh, Ian uh, yeah, it was into that stuff. But then, you know, the, the longer you're in an environment like that at a place like Tower Records, you get exposed to everything. And I just gravitated more towards like guitar based rock. So, uh, you know, by the mid 80s, I was mostly into groups like REM and the replacements. There you go. Well, let's see. Jim Blossoms formed uh, here in Tempe in 1987. Originally, uh, Jesse Valenzuela was the lead singer. And their rhythm guitar player um, had a drug problem. So they, they played out for a few months. I was at uh, a number of those shows because they were, they were an exciting band and they were well known. And they had all, Doug and Bill had been in previous bands, and so they had a reputation. 
So I was a, an excited fan and I was trying to start my own band at the time and uh, Bill Lean, our bass player, he and I worked together at Tower Records for some time. Okay. And a few years after that I was working across the street at Zia Records on University and one day the phone rings at Zia. I answer the phone, hello, Zia Records, what can I do for you? And it was Bill across the street at Tower and he asked me to audition for Jim Blossoms. That was a Tuesday night. I auditioned on Wednesday night. Yeah. I got the job and I was playing rhythm guitar. Jesse was the lead singer. Gotcha. We rehearsed on Thursday night and I, by that point I managed to learn I think about eight songs. Okay. Then we played Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night at Long Walks. Yeah, so it, it, was, yeah. it was just, you know, within two days of getting the phone call, I was, I was playing a, th a three-night stand at Long Walks. And so the first night I knew eight songs. By the second night I knew like 10. By the third night I had about 12 or 14 songs. Right. And, you know, just to fill up time, I was throwing out ideas like, well, you know, what about uh, Dead Skunk in the Middle of the Road or, uh, you know, a Little Bit of Soul. And I would front those. I'd hand the guitar to Jesse and I would sing lead on those tunes. And then over a period of a, a couple of months, it was just decided that Jesse and I would switch places, that he would yeah. become the rhythm guitar player, sing that. background vocals, and I would, uh, I would take over lead. And, uh, you know, I have to give Jesse so much credit for his uh, understanding and the lack of ego. Exactly. You know, I mean, it's yeah. it's kind of unprecedented in, in rock history for a lead singer to say, you know what, you'd be better at this than me. Absolutely. I can do what you're doing better than you. Let's just switch for the betterment of yeah. the group. And, you know, it, it really did make a difference. And I was just so relieved because as a guitar player, I was way, way out of my league. And, okay. I'll, I, you know, I wanted to be a front man. Yeah. So... Yeah. I just happened to, to to score the you know the job of fronting the the best band in town and um, you know and it's still doing it yay. So now from there. Um, now correct me if I'm wrong, but Doug Hopkins was the songwriter. He was the main songwriter. He uh, he wrote the majority of the tunes, but Jesse was also uh, writing a lot of songs. Okay. And then as soon as I joined, I started bringing in songs, but, you know, I was the new guy. I'd never been in a band before. I was just a bedroom songwriter doing open mic nights and stuff like that. And so I had never actually been in a band. So Doug didn't have a lot of patience for my songwriting, and he, he really wasn't that interested in allowing me to be a part of the, the songwriting structure. Yeah. But every once in a while, they would... I'd come up with something that was doable and so uh, you know it, I think I had turned in three or four songs that the band was playing and eventually I wrote Allison Road and that was kind of the moment where the entire band had to start taking me seriously as a yeah. as a songwriter Absolutely. and uh, you know I I know that being in a band with Doug and Jesse raised my game as a songwriter. You know, just being around those guys made me better at it. Right. And having to compete with them, I, I learned right away that if, you know, I wasn't turning in really great material, that it was yeah. just not going to be received with any enthusiasm. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, it took until I turned in a hit single to finally like earn uh, earn my place as a as a songwriter in the group okay so so now you guys have formed your lead how do you guys transition into the first album into getting you know the notoriety that it started to get like when did things kind of start to pop off well in 88 we were chosen as uh, by the Phoenix New Times is the best of Phoenix. Okay. And they selected us to represent them at South by Southwest in nice. 1989. Wow. So we went to Austin for the first time in 89. 
And immediately following that, A&R guys started coming around Tempe. And one organization that recruited us was ASCAP. And so we made a couple of good friends at ASCAP. Uh, There was a guy who was like our age named Tom DeSabia, and he was like a vice president, and he was in charge of, I guess, artist relations or something to that effect. He started bringing us around, and out in L.A., we we would drive out to L.A. once a month to do this ASCAP showcase at the Coconut Teaser. Okay. So all through 89, and into 1990, we were driving out to Hollywood once a month, and we would do the, the teaser showcase for ASCAP, and then we would get gigs at some of the other local clubs, Viper Room or whatever it was. Yeah, man, definitely. And labels started coming around, and pretty soon we had been courted by most of the major labels. We had meetings with Warner and MCA and okay. Sony and Epic and Columbia and... A&M was the label that won us over. And it was just a fantastic historic label and just something about their their pitch to us made sense. And they had this really cool headquarters in in Hollywood just off of Hollywood Boulevard and okay. we just knew we were a part we could be a part of a, a really important historic label. You know, artists like everything from Peter Frampton to The Police, Barry White, Janet Jackson. Right. It was a great label. And we were signed by the same guy who had signed Soundgarden and Extreme. And so our A&R guy was on the rise. Everything he was signing was charting and really doing well and so we were in we were in good company and the label uh, you know had a lot of hope for us so they uh, they we signed in like May of 90 to A&M they brought us out to California later that year to record with a big shot producer and he was an award-winning producer he was a really big deal his name was Albie Galutin and he had produced things like uh, the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack and records for Barry Gibb and Barbra Streisand. He was doing that sort of wing of pop. And then in the 80s, he decided to try to become alternative. And the the first alternative group he produced was a band called Jellyfish, which were critical darlings. And so A&M's like, let's let's try this. And it it just did not work. It was a lot of personality conflicts. So we... We kind of blew it. We we blew a hundred thousand dollars. We were there for two months, and we got nothing to show for it. I haven't even heard those recordings wow. since then. But we recorded at least half of what ended up being on New Miserable Experience. Right. But we we threw it all away. It just didn't work. And so yeah. we thought we were going to get dropped. We yeah. you know we felt like total failures. And, you know, we came home from Hollywood with our tail between our legs. You know, so much pressure on us. You know, like every other local band is looking at us like, you know, what are these guys going to do? And we just, we just blew it. And so we thought A&M would, would drop us. But what they, what, one of the great things about that label is they wanted to build careers. They weren't looking for one hit wonders. They wanted entire catalogs of of quality music. They wanted to build a career, so they weren't ready to give up on us. They gave us $20,000 to come home and self-produce an EP. Okay. So we recorded five songs uh, here in Tempe, and we released an EP that was called Up and Crumbling. That came out in the fall of 91. They put us out on the road. I felt like we were the only band in America on tour in December of 1991. It was a grueling tour, driving through the snow. Um, We played like the whole country, probably 30 30 shows. A lot of it was like opening for other local bands. 
Uh, there was no radio airplay to speak of. There was very little label support. We weren't selling records, but they wanted to stick us out there and see see if we could grow, see if we yeah. had it. It, it was really a, a way to mature us and yeah. to, to sort of shake the tree and see what kind of rotten fruit was going to come out. So we were either going to come out of it stronger and smarter and more professional or we were going to fall apart. And so it was sometime, uh, sometime in 91 after we had finished up and crumbling. If we were talking about producers, and so we were throwing around the names of you know people that we admired that made some of our favorite records. And yeah. ironically, a couple of the names we threw out were Don Dixon and Ed Stasium, both of whom produced Smithereens records. Right. So we were into those type of producers, and they were they were suggesting this guy out of Memphis named John Hampton. And we, they had him remix one of our songs for a movie soundtrack or something. Okay. And I remember Jesse and I talking about producers, who are we going to use? And Jesse said, well, the label likes this John Hampton guy. Okay. And he's the guy that recorded Tommy Keene and The Replacements. Yeah. And as soon as I made that connection, I'm like, he did those two albums? Those are like two of my favorite records. They right. sound amazing. That's, that's the guy. Yeah. There was no doubt at that point. So we decided to uh, hire John. We booked studio time in, uh, in Memphis at Ardent Recording Studios, which is a legendary place, yeah. which was originally built to record a band called Big Star. And we were all fans of Big Star. Yeah. It was a, a, a fantastic legendary studio where you know groups like REM and ZZ Top had made records and we thought felt like okay let's go be a part of this this thing happening in Memphis and so we went out to Memphis in 19 in February of 92 and we made New Miserable Experience with John Hampton who was exactly the right kind of personality for us and he could see all of our personality flaws all of the, the conflicts we were having within the group yeah. and he just somehow knew how to get the best performances out of us yeah. despite all of the the personal turmoil that was going on and right. so uh, John became a big part of uh, of the band a big part of our success he was a big part of my life uh, a mentor he helped me build my recording studio and uh, I miss him terribly. He was a great guy, and he was a, he's a big part of our success. So anyway, that, that's the story of how we got to that point. Anyway, I remember once being on the phone with our A&R guy. This was before we recorded uh, with A&M. And I had just seen a video on MTV, the band called The Rembrandts, yeah. who have since become good friends of ours. Okay. And they had a song called, uh, they had a hit single out, at the time, and I remember being on the phone with our A and R guy and saying, "You know, this Rembrandt song, this is, this is pretty good, and he, it's kind of a, you know, I think it just cracked the top forty or whatever." And yeah. our and our A and R guy said to me, "Well, yeah, well, you'll have a hit too." Yeah. And I remember being sort of taken aback and a little bit shocked, like, "Really? You really think we're going to have a right. a hit?" Yeah. And he's like, "Oh yeah." He's like, "You know, there's no telling, you know." you know how big or whatever but yeah eventually you're if, if nothing else you'll have a song that gets out there I think is what he said and I remember being like wow really you know that's <laughs> yeah. and here you know you'd think if you if you got signed to a major label that that's what they would be thinking but here it was yeah. to me it was like a shock to find out well they actually expected us to succeed <laughs> yeah. you know and I'm like really you really think we're gonna have a hit you yeah. know and <laughs> You know, because most of the groups we listened to were bands like The Replacements. We never expected to right. uh, have a bigger hit record than The Replacements, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that was that was a cool moment hearing him, hearing him say that. Um, yeah, you'll have a song that gets out there. <laughs> Well, Follow You Down is really special because we had recorded 
the entire record. We went back to Memphis, made made the record with John. We were done, we thought, and then the label called and said, "You need to go write another hit." Yeah. The record's not quite there. You need another hit, and they were they were explicit that it had to be a hit. So this is a moment where we're under more pressure than at any other point in our career. Yeah, we're f following up a, a really successful debut album. Sure. We no longer have Doug Hopkins in the band as a songwriter. Yeah. We have to prove ourselves. And this was the moment where all of the weight of our career was on top of us. And it was, it was our responsibility to cough up a hit. And we wrote Follow You Down. So I consider that like maybe the, the single greatest accomplishment that we ever did, to be under that kind of intense pressure and scrutiny and to deliver a top 10 single um, was, was a huge success for us. So uh, Follow You Down is of course a very special tune to us. And then the album, that album got you guys Grammy nominated. Uh, we, Another great song on the record, As Long As It Matters, is a song that Jesse and I wrote together. He called me one Saturday morning. I was doing bongs and watching Batman the Animated Series. Yeah. And the phone rings, and Jesse's like, hey, Rob, I, I, I got a chorus, you know? And he, yeah. played, he played me the chorus for As Long As It Matters. And he said, you know, go, go write the verses now or whatever. And right. so, you know, I knew this was a solid chorus, and, I, you know, when you're when you're collaborating with someone like that, what you have to do is take take the chorus and then work backwards to tell the rest of the story. Right. You know, the the chorus is like the punchline, but what's yeah. the what's the rest of the joke that leads up to that yeah. chorus? Yeah. So I had to sort of work backwards lyrically to 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 complete the song. And I remember the first time, first couple times we ever played it together as a band in rehearsals, like feeling like this, this tune is really good. This is yeah. really special. Yeah, exactly. And I remember that was right about the time that Four Peaks Brewery was starting to, uh, they, they were next door. They hadn't opened the brewery yet, but they were in there like testing how to brew wow. and figuring out <laughs> the, the structure of the brewery. Yeah. And I remember th thinking, God, I hope the guys on the other side of the wall here us playing this song because this is going to be on the radio in another eight months from now or something, and wow. I, I hope I hope someone over there has makes makes that connection. So, right. and then also on that album, there's a couple of tunes that I wrote that I that I attached to. Uh, one of them is called "Not Only Numb," which mm -hmm. is uh, you know like my attempt to describe what it's like to be on the road. Yeah. Uh, to uh, my new girlfriend, who eventually I, I got married to. But that was kind of early in our relationship, and I was trying to describe to her, you know, what it's like. Right. And so, the, like, the, the lyrical hook, I feel this is probably one of the stronger lyrics I ever wrote, is, um, the air at home is thin when getting out than looking in. Mm. And I'm, t I'm talking about what it was like to to you know be at home be a hometown band then be gone right. out on the road and then come home to all this scrutiny right so um that that tune's pretty special and another one that's uh, one of my favorites uh, and we still play this with some regularity these days is uh, called competition smile and uh, that's a song i wrote where i you know, I, I heard that term somewhere. Um, somebody was talking about, you know, those models with their competition smiles. And I'm like, that's a cool lyric, yeah, you know? Yeah, so right. I'm in the habit of, you know, like writing things like that down when I hear something that sounds yeah, like a good idea a for a song. Mm -hmm. So I had, I had the, the title for the song long before I ever wrote the tune and I, I came up with the tune. I was on my way out to uh, Canyon Lake. I had just, uh, just gotten a boat and I was on, on my way out there and, you know, smoking pot in the car and yeah. the, the song just kind of hit me. I remember like looking over the steering wheel up the sky and I, I just started singing that tune. Wow. 
And, you know, it was never a single, but uh, it's, it's eventually sort of gone down as one of our uh, classic tunes from that era. So. Absolutely. Yeah, and around this time too, man, you guys were doing a lot of like late night talk show performances. You did Letterman, Leno, you did Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. how, how was that? That was super cool. Um, the director at SNL at the time was a friend of my ex-wife's because they worked together at MTV, which I, I met my ex-wife at MTV. She was in, worked in production there. Oh. And um, the SNL director, Beth McCarthy, was also came out of that MTV pool of uh, yeah. production talent. She got the job at Saturday Night Live and she kind of lobbied hard to get us on there. So right after Congratulations, I'm Sorry was released, we did Saturday Night Live. Beth was the director and the host was Phil Hartman. Wow. And Beth, Beth and I were friends. She told Phil Hartman that I was a huge Simpsons fan. Oh. And Phil Hartman walks up to me it's like we just we just got in or we're approaching the stage. Phil Hartman comes right over me, shakes my hand, yeah. and he goes, "Hi, Robin. I'm Troy McClure, and you may remember me from such educational films as Locker Room Towel Fight, The Blinding of Larry Driscoll." <laughs> <laughs> and my jaw just hit the floor. You know, it's wow. like, wow, I'm 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 shaking hands with Phil Hartman. This is so cool. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, we're a, we're a working band. We, we do a lot of shows. I think this year we're going to top out at about 85 or 90 shows total, which yeah. is a little less than pre-pandemic numbers. Right. For us, um, we got, we're got doing a lot of private shows these days, which are great because they pay really well. Right. You don't have to sell tickets. Your name isn't an honor marquee. There's no pressure on you no. to do anything but just show up and show play up for the allotted amount of time and not say anything stupid, which uh, I've learned the hard way not to do. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're doing a couple of private shows here and there. We're performing an uh, exciting gig. We're playing at Alice Cooper's Christmas Pudding December 3rd at the Celebrity Theater, along with Sammy Hagar and Rob Zombie. Nice. So this will be, the I think, the fourth time we've done Alice Cooper's Christmas Pudding. It's always a fun show. And then we've got an anniversary tour starting in a couple of weeks. We're playing, uh, we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of New Miserable Experience. So we're going out, we're playing the whole album. Uh, we were out doing that last spring and halfway through the tour, our bass player Bill broke his arm. Mm -hmm. So we had to reschedule okay. eight of those shows. And so we added a few more. So that, that starts in about a week. Then we do the Christmas pudding. And then next year, we got a pretty exciting gig in April. We're playing at Hootie Fest in Cancun, Mexico. Okay. Uh, hosted by Hootie and the Blowfish. We'll be co-headliners are Goo Goo Dolls, Bare Naked Ladies. And then also on the bill are uh, good friends of ours, Everclear, Collective Soul, oh. Cowboy Mouth. Yeah. And I'm trying to get the Smithereens on uh, like an opening slot on oh, the, on the bill. Time. So... Um, and speaking of the Smithereens, I got a show with them uh, coming up in a couple of days. We're finally bringing the Smithereens to Tempe. Nice. So we're playing at the Marquee on Friday night in Tempe, Friday the 21st. And then in January, with the Smithereens, we are doing the 80s cruise. This is insane. Um, it's, a, it's like a seven-day cruise, leaves out of Los Angeles, okay. goes down to Mexico, and headlining it are um, Devo, The Church, Brett Michaels, Kim Wilde, Living Color. Wow. Uh, it's just a crazy lineup. And then there's a whole bunch of other uh, acts, uh, including us, the Smithereens. Right, and right. so I get to go on the 80 cru 80s cruise and be in the Smithereens. That's going to be so awesome. And yeah. I'm especially excited about uh, sharing the stage with the church. They were a huge inspiration for not only me, but for, uh, for Doug Hopkins and for yeah. Bill Lean. They, 
if you listen to early church records, I think that's sort of the prototype for what Jim Blossoms were trying to do when we first started. And I always thought that Doug's songwriting was heavily influenced by the church. I know mine was. And a song like um, The Unguarded Moment literally led to Doug coming up with Found Out About You. So I think they, I think they had a really significant uh, influence on the Jim Blossom sound, and they've always been one of my favorite bands. So I'm, I'm psyched to, uh, uh, to be able to share the boat with, uh, with the church. So anyway, that's the '80s Cruise. I think that's what the website is too, if you want to check it out. Uh, The80scruise.com. So. Congratulations on the road. You know, Allison Road, we got, you got a street you. named after you guys. That's huge. Well, That's well deserved. It's really cool. You know, Doug, Doug was so, he was, he could be such a, such an asshole sometimes. And we, when I first brought that song in, he used, to, he knew it was a great song. Yeah, he, yeah. he used to, he told me, he's like, a couple of these lyrics are really great. But he would say, the best thing about that song is my riff. You know, and so he, he just, he always sort of begrudged me that, you know, I had that, that tune. And so I know that he would be extremely jealous that the, the it's not Hey Jealousy Street, it's right. Allison, <laughs> yeah. Allison Road Avenue. He would be so insanely jealous right. of that. So I just, you know, fuck you, Doug. I got a, <laughs> I got a street, you know, and I, I, so I know he would be so proud. And, you know, for all of the, the conflict that he and I had, um, I, I'm, I'm so certain that he would be r r really proud of, of our band and, um, and of, of me, you know, he took a lot of his anger out on me. I was a target for him. And I, I think if he were still alive, he would, he would, he would respect what you know we've been able to do as a group. So, and he'd be super jealous that I'm in the Smithereens too. So, <laughs> perfect. Fuck you, Doug. <laughs> oh, I love it, man. Yeah, but you know, well, while you know, while we're on the subject of Doug, I have to acknowledge, and I mean this with all sincerity, we we couldn't have done it without him. You know, right. and. Uh, yeah. His, his songwriting was foundational. His vision was foundational to our group. And I miss him terribly and, you know, I, I wish, wish things could have been different, you know. It's humbling and very satisfying. You know, I started this interview telling you about how I wanted to be, I decided to become a rock singer or I decided that that was my biggest life goal when I was eight years old. So uh, to have been able to actually make a life doing that is incredibly gratifying and humbling. And knowing that songs that I wrote in my bedroom, we can go to any city in America and I can get 500 people to sing along with it. Oh, yeah. It's incredibly satisfying and it you know it came at a really really high price and it's really difficult to succeed the way the way we have and it requires intense sacrifice you know to be in that van for months and months at a time with no crew driving ourselves hauling our own gear doing five shows six shows a week it's grueling and this was in the days before you know, uh, cell phones and Uber Eats and stuff. So, you know, we would get to the ho the crappy hotel and it'd be like, well, we gotta, we gotta find a Denny's or someplace yeah. we can eat. And, you know, so literally it required like opening the phone book and calling yeah. restaurants yeah. to right. see like, where are you located? Yeah. You know, is there anything, go down to the desk at the hotel. Are there any restaurants nearby, you know? And, right. um, you know, you have, when you're when you're gone that much, you sacrifice all of your relationships with your roommates, your girlfriends, your family. You're gone, and you have to find a way to pay your bills and keep your life at home from completely falling apart. And it's in, and at the same time, you're in the van together all the time, 19 hours a day sometimes, yeah. right. for months and months at a time, 
And so you really get to know your bandmates. Absolutely. You, you either survive that as a family or you fall apart. And this yeah. is one of the reasons that so many great bands make one record and then you're like, whatever happened to them? Yeah. Well, I can tell you, they went out on the road they and they, the road. They, they couldn't hack yeah. it. Exactly. You know, and we didn't, we didn't, we almost didn't make it either, you know, and it, it's so we've, we've earned everything that we've accomplished. And, um, you know, we got a nice slot. We're a mid-level rock band. We're still able to go out and do it. Um, we, and strangely enough, right now we're riding high and we sell more concert tickets than we ever have in our entire career. We sell more merchandise than we ever have in our entire career. Yeah. And we just made the biggest deal of our career. We sold an, uh, a very large stake in our catalog to a company called Primary Wave. Okay. And these are the same people that just bought up like Stevie Nicks catalog. I think oh. she got like 80 million bucks. We didn't get anything close to $80 million, right. but, it was still the, yeah. but it was still the biggest deal of our career. Right. And it came in the middle of the pandemic when we yeah. weren't sure if we were ever gonna be able yeah. to well, do it true. again. So, um, in so many ways, our career is stronger than ever. Certainly, our partnership and our brotherhood is, is stronger than ever. And we've, you, you get to a point where you, you have to, f you know, f find a way to be grateful for everything. Absolutely. Just shut up and do your job. Do not piss off anybody else in the band. You know, it's not your job to piss anybody off. It's your job to shut up and do your job. And, uh, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of experience, a lot of bloody trial and error to get to a point where you can keep a band together for 34 years, you know. And a lot of that also has to do with the fact that we've got hit songs in our catalog. So, you know, if, if we had never had a hit, we might not be together, but having a hit having hits not just one but several tunes that we can play give us an opportunity to do a lot of shows and so uh, you know wrapping it back to how you how you phrase this it's it's incredibly gratifying to have set out to be in a band to make something of the band and for it to succeed in a way that you you can't possibly imagine when you're when you're starting out all right, folks, thank you for hanging out with me. I'm Robin Wilson, lead singer of Jim Blossoms and part-time singer for the Smithereens. I'm happy to be back here in my home in Tempe. Thank you for tolerating my five. Peace. And there you have it. Man, shout out to Robin Wilson. This was an absolute honor. Uh, you know, Hey Jealousy came out in 92. I was nine years old. I was in fourth grade. And I remember hearing that record and just playing it nonstop. And then, you know, seeing them on MTV, you know, like I was telling them in the interview, you know, back then being on MTV was a big deal. Like that meant something. And so, you know, watching it, we were like, wow. And then you find out they're from Arizona. You're like, wow, they're on MTV. Like, and they're from here, you know, like Phoenix is on the map, <laughs> you know? And so, um, gosh, you know, and then I love how you talked about long ones. You know, I was, I was a little too young to catch them in their early days there, unfortunately my father used to go and then it brought me back to you know me and my father going to Long Wong's when I was a little older you know on the mill you know getting a burger some fried mushrooms and then going across the street to center point and catching a flick you know just good times man good times and you know just thank you guys so much man you know you're an absolute gem Robin um, you know everything that you guys contributed to the music culture you are much appreciated my brother and thank you so much for being a part of our platform this was just, like I said, it was just an absolute honor, huge treat. So I wish you nothing but continued success in everything that you got going on. And uh, make sure you guys follow them on social media. And shout out to my brother, Jimmy Nelson, on that camera. Make sure you guys subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tell a Friend to Tell a Friend. The numbers are starting to go up. Make sure you hit that bell notification so you get notified on all future episodes. All right. Well, this was definitely one for the books. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Until next time, stay tuned, stay blessed, stay healthy, and just give me five. Everything you get, you got the